Ha, huh, one, two, one, two. Hey, we're, we're going. All right, uh, well, thanks for coming out tonight. The, this evening's topic, Uses of Philosophy for Living Friendship. Now, I, I think friendship is one of the great undervalued concepts in the American world. If you talk to people in other countries, in fact, this is one of the things they hold against Americans, um, is they're, they're not sure we really have a good grasp on the central importance and, and value of friendships for quality life. And this is one of those ideas that we just take for granted and we tend not to think about very much. But if you look at ancient philosophy, in fact, if you look at philosophy pretty much up until the you know, 16th or 17th century, one of the primary subjects of every philosopher, basically, that you can look at was friendship. Look in the Persian world, Look in the Chinese world, look in the ancient Greek and Roman world. What were philosophers, thinkers, writers, letter writers, considering, pondering, reflecting on, probably as much as any other subject, it was uh, friendship. And I was trying to put together a list of philosophers, Greek and Romans in particular, who had talked about friendship, and it just became easier to say I couldn't find any that hadn't talked about friendship. Now, some of their works might not have survived, but Aristotle goes on for, for at great length. Uh, Plato in, in the Lysis dialogue goes on. Well, the whole dialogue is, in fact, about the question of friendship. Um, it comes up just everywhere, consistently. And yet, somehow, I feel that it's fallen a little bit on hard times now. So I want to kind of reflect on what it means to be a friend, sort of the philosophical history of friendship, um, and then, why do we struggle? What, what are the issues that we have in our contemporary world with friendship, particularly the United States, with which I'm most familiar? But the, but the concept of friendship goes as far back as we have records. The first great epic, the first literary work of any note that has survived, is the Epic of Gilgamesh. The Epic of Gilgamesh is a buddy movie. It's a friendship movie. It's a story of two friends, Gilgamesh and Enkidu, who go out and have adventures together until Enkidu, unfortunately, is killed. And this sets off the entire second half of the epic, which is Gilgamesh trying to deal with, come to terms with, the death of his friend. So the entire epic, the central theme, the driving narrative force is friendship. How to be a friend? Who's your friend? What does it mean to be a friend? And I just have this sort of longish excerpt I wanted to read from the opening. Uh, this is, I think, the fourth chapter of the Epic of Gilgamesh. Uh, again, by the way, this is at least 5,000 years old. So, I mean, this, this is just goes all the way back. And Gilgamesh has a dream. He says to his mother, mother, she was a, a god, by the way, mother, last night I had a dream. I was full of joy. The young heroes round me and I walked through the night under the stars of the firmament and one, a meteor of the stuff of Anu, fell down from heaven. I tried to lift it, but it proved too heavy. All the people of Uruk came around to see it. The common people jostled and the nobles thronged to kiss its feet. And to me, its attraction was like the love of a woman. They helped me. I braced my forehead and I raised it with, my, with thongs and brought it to you, and you yourself pronounced it my brother. So this is the dream of the coming of Enkidu, who will be his friend. It's, it, it comes to you from heaven. It is the great blessing of the gods. It is so powerful and mighty you can barely lift it. It fills you with joy. It fills you with love. Uh, for the object. It's, it's, this is the, again, this is the opening sequence. Gilgamesh needs a friend, so the gods provide him with a friend. And they're equals, and this is key, and we'll talk about this at length. The key thing about the two of them is they're equally matched. The gods say this, Gilgamesh says this, and Kidu says this. And then they basically form this bond of love and companionship that allows him to just go out in the world. And in various places, Enkidu says, I don't think this is a good idea. And Gilgamesh says, I'm going to do it anyway. And Enkidu says, OK, I'll do it with you. I don't think it's a good idea, but if you want to do it, that's why I'm here, to help you do it. And then when Gilgamesh is sort of courage flags, Enkidu says, well, wait a second. Here we are. We said we were going to do it. 
don't fail me now. And Gilgamesh says, you're right. I can't fail you now. So this, this tenet of people coming together is central to every historical, philosophical, cultural system pretty much that we can find. And the oldest epic we have, friendship is right there. Um, if you want to think about definition, I put the definition, if you look at the etymological definition of friendship, always a good place to start when you're thinking about a subject. I mentioned this last time. And the etymology is, is perfect. It's as if I made it up just for this lecture. And it starts with, uh, from Old English frond, one attached to another by feelings of personal regard and preference. And then it goes through from Proto-Germanic lover or friend and then the High Dutch Old Frisian. It keeps going back until you get to uh, the Gothic um, pre-loving and pre-to love, which is the same root as free, which is to say it is those you love freely. I think this is an important place to begin. Um, if we go back to the ancient world, they're not even that ancient of the world, most of the people you dealt with, you owed either duties or obligations of some kind to. So if, if you want, the example I came up with is if you think of the play Hamlet, it's a great friendship in the play of Hamlet between Hamlet and Horatio. Everybody in the play that Hamlet deals with, besides Horatio, is problematic for him. His mother, he owes duties of filial as a son, but he also thinks she might be a threat to him. His stepfather slash uncle slash murderer of his father slash usurper of his throne, obvious, all kinds of problems there. He can't just be a father because he's also a political agent. Ophelia, the woman he theoretically loves, is being used by the now king against him, and he suspects this, so he can't trust her. Laertes, Polonius, everybody in the play has a political agenda or certain duties and obligations that they must fulfill that make them either a threat or a potential threat to Hamlet. And so this is one reason he's sort of so tentative all the time, why, why he's, he's sort of feeling the water. Who can I trust? Who can I? One person in the play, and that person is Horatio. By the way, Horatio, basically the one person who survives the play. Good night, sweet prince. You know, this, this, um, that, but this is the way the ancient world worked. If you weren't a slave, if you were some sort of noble and aristocrat who had the freedom to choose who you wanted to spend time with, those would be the only people that you didn't have either legal or political bonds to. Particularly at a time when marriage, which we'll talk about more, was not the kind of bond that we think of it now. Your wife was an obligation, a duty, a responsibility, often married for reasons other than love or affection. Women, again, generally considered to be not that uh, appropriate to consider as your equals. And so that wasn't a font of friendship. So there were these few people in the world that you could choose to spend your time with. And it was those people, and this is, this is sort of throughout the history of the philosophy of friendship, that clearly determine the greater part of the quality of your life. Much happens to us that we can't control. You may be familiar with this sort of experience. Things happen in the political and economic world that we may not wish to have happen. Um, how we respond, what can we control? One thing, in theory, is the people we choose to surround ourselves with. Now, this is not family, by the way, although we're much freer from family than they, when we ever have been in history. But one definition of family is the people in your life you can't fire. <laughs> right? You're just, they're just sort of there. You're stuck with them for good or ill. But we don't choose them. 
We're, we do not choose our parents, we do not choose our siblings, we don't choose our aunts and uncles or our grandparents or our nieces or nephews, they're just there. Which can be great or not so great. But our friends we do choose, and that volitional aspect has always been seen as a great opportunity but also a great threat, a great danger. If you choose the wrong kind of people to be your friends, Ooh, we've all had this experience, yes? Doesn't help with the quality of your life very much. Um, so a couple of, of, there's just so many great quotes on friendship, but just to go through the issues, um, Aristotle says, friendship is not only invaluable, but beautiful. Being a good friend and a good person is the same thing. So one, th th by the way, this is recurrent. Aristotle talks about this, Plutarch talks about this, um, Confucius talks about this. The, the, in Confucianism, there's five fundamental relationships. Ruler to ruled, father to son, uh, husband to wife, older brother to younger brother, and friend to friend. To have a good life, one has to fulfill all those obligations appropriately. In Confucianism, you cannot have a good life without being a good friend. In medieval Zoroastrianism, in the Persian tradition, basically the follow-on from the Epic of Gilgamesh, the sort of uh, multi-thousand year tradition that goes way back, but in, in the Middle Ages, uh, you know, 12th, 13th century Zoroastrianism, um, they, they put such a high emphasis on friendship that they said it was a religious duty. One had to be a good friend, or you were in essence a bad human being. Because friendship is such a good for so many that if you do not foster it in your own heart and your own life, then you failed God. And they wrote treaties and stories about Ahura Mazda, the god of the Zoroastrians, um, and his friends. So they actually thought that God had friends because friendship was such a good that, of course, he must have had friends. Right? So this, this is an extraordinarily powerful concept. But the, the Aristotle puts it just like that. To be a good person and to be a good friend, same thing. You can't live a full, joyful, vibrant life without people to share it with. This is controversial. The Stoics uh, and the Roman and, and Greek tradition always preach that you should be self-sufficient. Stand on your own feet. You should be a world unto yourself. The outside world should not shake you. And then three or four pages later, they'll talk about the importance of friendship and completing your life. It's this fundamental tension in, in, in Stoicism, and you'll see this in other places as well, because we want to believe we're independent. We want to believe we're standing on our own feet, but it's so clear that our lives are so vastly superior when we do have friends to share them with, when we have companions. I always ask people, you know, reflect on your own life, and, and I think some of the best things we tend to remember are the people that we spent time with having whatever events were occurring. Often the events themselves not that great. Challenging, maybe even sort of uh, negative in a way, but if you have a negative experience with really fun, valuable people who are your real friends, somehow that makes it great, right? There we were in jail, you know, and we were, you know, that's, uh, you know, that, that, and somehow that's okay if you're in there with the right people, you know, it's, it's going to be fun, uh, uh, or at least funny later, right? I mean, that's the, but that's the power of friendship. Uh, another one here from Oscar Wilde, and, I, and this, I think, gets to the heart of what it means to be a friend, or one of the aspects of it. Anybody can sympathize with the suffering of a friend, but it requires a very fine nature to sympathize with a friend's success. And this, I want to raise the issue of why friendship is great. I think one aspect of it is, if you have a real friend, one definition of this an aspect, it is the idea that you are as happy for them to have a success or a joy or a pleasure as you would be for you to have that pleasure. But since we're so different as people, 
I can be very happy for my friend to have some joy or success or pleasure that I actually have no interest in. And what this does is it dramatically expands my capacity to experience joy and happiness. Because things that otherwise I would not enjoy or even be interested in suddenly can give me a great deal of pleasure. I go, wow, that is great. I wouldn't want to do that. I have no interest in that. But they do. And their pleasure and their joy, because they're my friend, is my pleasure and my joy. It, it, just, it, it has this manifold aspect, not just for the amount of joy we can have, but for the range of things that can give us joy. And certainly we all must have had the experience where you do something just for somebody else because they're your friend that you probably don't even want to do, but they derive so much joy in it that you kind of like it. If nothing else, you just like to sit there and watch them enjoy it or participate with them and say, well, they're having so much fun, great. Makes it all worthwhile. But this is a very tricky slope, so we're going to return to that. But the, keep that in mind, that this capacity to share someone else's success. Oscar Wilde, always on point, of course. Um, and, and what he's pointing out here is that when he uses friend the first time, this is derogatory sense of friend. Oh, we love it when other people suffer. These aren't our real friends. It's when they succeed that your friendship is tested. Am I genuinely happy for them, or am I envious? Ah, if you're envious, yeah, it's not a very good friend, I, I would say. Uh, another quote. I don't need a friend who changes when I change and who nods when I nod. My shadow does a much better job at that. <laughs> this is Plutarch. Now, this is significant because we often think of friendship as being agreeable or people we get along with, people we have like mind with, that we share ideas. And certainly there needs to be a certain amount of that. But conversely, I would think it's important to think about the fact that friends are people who can tell us, no, you're wrong, or at least I think you're wrong. This is, and Kindu says this to Gilgamesh, no, 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 we should not go kill the monster in the woods, bad idea. And Gilgamesh says, no, I'm going to do it anyway. And he goes, okay, I think it's stupid, but okay, I'll go with you. See, and that, that's the idea. That ha, that is very fine, right? We know this is difficult. To, to, to when you see a friend and you're like, ah, how do I broach that subject? How do I say, ooh, this is, this is not good. I think you're making a mistake. One of my friends said, uh, he, he said, oh, I'm this woman that he knew was going to move in with him. And I said, wow. And he says, what do you think of that? I said, I think if you had just told me I was going to run my hand through a bandsaw, <laughs> that's what I think of that. But you're an adult, and if you wish to run your hand through a bandsaw, that is your own business. And I cannot stop you from doing that. And it turned out, of course, to be just like running his hand through a bandsaw. <laughs> But which we then laughed about later. Oh, you know, it's an honest mistake. Uh, but but that you know, but it was okay for me to say. I was comfortable enough that I could say that, and we could laugh. And then you know, then we laughed even more later. Uh, but but you know, that capacity for people to say no, this is this is dumb. This is this is not a good idea at all. Uh, you know, that, that don't. What's wrong with you? Now, by the way, it doesn't mean you're right. It just means that you feel the obligation to be honest and you feel like you can be because they're not going to dislike you for disagreeing with them or criticizing them or at least trying to raise issues and say, wow, did you really think this through? And I think generally this works in retrospect. I think generally we go, yeah, I should have listened to you. That was dumb. But at least they cared enough to say to us, ooh, you might want to rethink that. You might want to just mm, give that a pause. And, that, and again, this, this element of friends being able to communicate directly. But notice there's always a risk here. There's always this, this element of risk because if we really are honest and then we do offend them, ah, 
And the more emotionally charged, which is to say more significant, whatever the decision is, the more dangerous this becomes. But this is what Plutarch is trying to drive at. I don't want to be surrounded by people who just agree with me. I have my shadow for that. I want to surround myself with people who want the best for me and disagree with me sometimes. Not all the time, but sometimes. Very, again, very tricky line. Um, Nietzsche, it's not lack of love, but lack of friendship that makes unhappy marriages. I think this is a fascinating concept because in the modern world, much of the friendship weight that we used to place outside of marriage, again, has been transferred into marriage. But of all of the sort of iconographic treatments in film or in poetry or on TV or in dating site ads, it's not clear that friendship is what we emphasize at all. It's all of the other elements, primarily erotic interest, right? That that's what should drive your relationship. Um, but, but, you know, how important is friendship? If you're going to spend your life with somebody, in theory, in practice, you know, whatever, what's the average, you know, six and a half years, uh, but in, in theory, <laughs> uh, you know, d don't you want to like them? Don't you want them to be your friend? Don't you want to have some concept of that? Yeah, it's very, uh, it's, it's tricky. And the last one here, Tennessee Williams. Life is partly what we make it and partly what it is made by the friends we choose. I think this is, this is a very significant one because it's back to what we started with Aristotle. I mean, besides health, I couldn't think of anything more influential on the quality of my life than the people I choose to spend it with. I mean, what else is there? I mean, it is those people who we surround ourselves with that make us feel good or bad. You know, I always, if, if I leave people and I feel tired and worn out and sort of the energy sucked out of me, I think, eh, I don't know if, if I should spend time with those people. But if I leave people and I go, oh, you know, I feel uplifted, I feel fulfilled. Then I can go, oh, yeah, maybe I should spend time with those people. You know, th those, those kinds of judgments. If you're always spending time with people who make you tired and feel run down, and they don't make you feel that good about yourself, well, you'll be tired and run down, and you won't feel that good about yourself, right? It's, it, it's not that, uh, you know, and it's not that they're lying to you and saying, wow, you're the greatest, you're the greatest. That's the Plutarch model. But on the other hand, are they, you know, that sort of niggling undercutting that people love to do all the time. Um, and so th these are just some of the key ideas that I thought were interesting to run through with those quotes. But I want to turn to the modern world and why I think we struggle with friendship so much. Through, again, through the history of philosophy, culture, Persians, Chinese, Japanese, Romans, Greeks, our culture, ah, friendship, we have almost no emphasis on it. Uh, and I'm moderately convinced we don't believe in it. It's, it's, and it's, it's slightly terrifying. And I give a bunch of examples, but a couple, I think one problem is we live in a hugely mobile society. Now, this is not necessarily a bad thing, except we don't take our friends with us. You can look at the aristocracy in Rome 2,000 years ago or in Britain 200 years ago, and they traveled around a lot. They had estates, they had villas, they had places in the city, they would summer here, they'd summer there, with the same people. It was always with the same people. They would complain about this, by the way. Oh, it's the same people everywhere you go. But the flip side of that was, Yes, they were traveling, but they were traveling with their friends. And many of these friends, if you had one very wealthy person, essentially just lived their whole lives with that person. They lived in their country estate, and then when that person went to the city, they lived in their house in the city. And when that person went to, you know, Italy, they went to Italy with them. Because they're your friends. Why would you want to go someplace without your friends. This makes no sense to anybody. 
And so you just traveled around with them. So mobility for us is a different kind of mobility in the ancient world. We tend to move places and travel without our friends. We go, goodbye, I'm off to college. I've asked my students this, I've said, have you ever sat down with all your friends and said, what college should we all go to? And then whatever college everybody gets into, that's the college you should go to because you all get in together. And their response is, you can't do that. And I'm like, that's not allowed? That's illegal? That breaks the law? They're like, well, no, but you can't, you can't do that. I'm like, why can't you do that? Well, you have to go to the best college you get into. I'm like, isn't the best college you can get into the one where your friends are? No, we absolutely do not believe this. We believe you should go to the best college, whatever the hell that means, by the way, a totally murky concept, uh, but we should go to the theoretically best college that I get into for me. And so that's our first big move. And then after college, what job should you take? You can look at the biography of John Maynard Keynes, and th they were this big group of friends uh, coming out of Cambridge, primarily, but not exclusively. Um, and they talked about this. Well, where are you going to apply? Maybe we should, we'll all apply for jobs over wherever you're going to be. Or, well, whoever gets the best job, we'll all just move there, and we'll take whatever jobs we can get. And so they, really, they actually planned like their careers out communally. And, and, and by, for comparison's sake, I was looking uh, at stories in the newspapers online, and there's all these stories about, oh, what, what does a married couple do when one of them gets a career offer in a different city, the dream job, but the other person has a good job in their city? And almost invariably, the response I found is, well, you just have a long-distance relationship. Because pursuing your career is clearly more important than living with your spouse, theoretically your friend. So if we're willing even to leave our spouses to pursue careers, wow. Forget random friends, you know, people that we're not actually legally bonded to, and in theory not having a lot of sex with, right? I mean, that just, just nope, goodbye, we'll see you later, off we go. And so that kind of crazy mobility, unrelated to having friends. And then if people come to visit, also we, we aren't set up for this. We tend to like people to visit for a day, or an afternoon, or 10 minutes. Right? Again, if you look at the patterns of the ancient world, people would come for six weeks, or three months, or six months. Imagine if somebody called you up and said, I'm coming for six months. In the ancient world, they thought, this is great, my friend, who lives in Syria, is coming for six months. How wonderful is that? See, we don't say that. We're like, six months? Don't you have a life? What are you doing? Go away. You know, and that is, it's, it, it just seems preposterous to us. But that, the notion that this is preposterous is new. People didn't used to think this was preposterous. If you had the freedom to choose, which, again, this was restricted. To, you know, most people were too poor or were in fact slaves, could not make these choices. But once you could make these choices, it just seemed obvious that what you wanted to do was spend as much time as possible with your friends. Um, and so there's a, I, I, and I can't remember, I want to say it's uh, Aristarchus, but I don't think it is. But anyway, one of the ancient Greek philosophers, one of the tyrants writes him, and says, hey, I want to give you this big bunch of money to come live with me and teach me and, you know, sort of hang out here because I think you're a great thinker and you'll be good at my court. And he wrote back and said, thank you for the kind offer, but currently I have enough money for myself and my friends, so I need no more and I wouldn't want to leave them. So this is another aspect that I think has changed. We live in a culture of I, me, my, mine. The more I get from myself, the better off I am. I have enough for myself 
and my friends. What, what an amazing concept that enough means for my friends. This is what we're really talking about. I, I don't even think we, that doesn't even pass through our minds. Right? That, that, that's completely almost insignificant in our culture today. That we would stop and go, oh, enough is all about my friends, not about me. But all of our achievements, why do I go to the best school? Because it's the best school for me. Why do I pursue my career? Because that'll be the best opportunity for me. And then I will get mine, and I will have mine, and then I will be great and my life will be fulfilled. Number one complaint of people when they get older, loneliness. Not health, not money, loneliness. This should not be surprising, which should not be surprising because, of course, that's what we choose in our culture. We choose to isolate ourselves. Because if you're continually saying, I, me, my, mine, then where is the room for yours, theirs, or even ours, right? If my friend's success is my success, then I want them to succeed as much as I want me to succeed. One way you can see this is in work environments are, are notorious for this. If you live any place that's moderately, or you work someplace that's moderately sizable, in theory, we're all working together and this is great. In practice, there's gonna be one or two positions that open up for promotion and probably I want it and I don't want you to get it because if you get it, it means I don't get it. And so everybody goes, oh, congratulations, you got the promotion I wanted, right? And it's not really a true friendship environment if that's how people feel. Microsoft, by the way, has this in evil spades. They've decided to do this as wrong as possible. So they're on teams at Microsoft, which are beginning to change, by the way. They realize this is horrible. They're on teams, and everybody on the team is graded relentlessly on job performance. Only the people who've performed the best can be promoted, and the people who perform the worst will be fired. So it's an automatic elimination and promotion system. And so rather than working as a team, everybody can see the problem with this, right? Everybody is busy trying to make sure nobody else gets anything done and making sure they get credit for anything that is achieved because if they don't do this, they will be fired. And a vicious anti-human situation to develop. And shockingly, Microsoft has a problem with retention and employee burnout. I wonder, I wonder where this originates. I can't imagine. Right? The opposite of that is to say, no, if our team succeeds and somebody on our team succeeds and gets promoted, that means we're doing well to reward success as a group. See, yeah, no, we struggle with that. We just basically, we don't believe in it. I, me, my, mine is the opposite of friendship. And again, you can see this in, in virtually any achievement and the way we award achievements. So you give Academy Award for Best Picture goes to one person, the director. And the directors always stand up there and they go, I want to thank the following 1,000 people. Because it, was, it really is a group undertaking. But in our culture, we do not tend to reward groups. We want to reward individuals. It's the director's award for best picture, supporting actress, whatever it is. It's an individual gets the award for the thing. Even when you're in one of the great communal art forms, which is filmmaking. And at some level, that whole concept destroys the communal aspect of it, right? It's, it's, this, it's this struggle. Um, uh, Wynton Marsalis, the jazz musician, was in a recording session, and he turned away when he was playing from the microphone. He says, the band is playing great, everything's going wonderful. And he turns away from the microphone while he's jamming, and the recording engineer 
comes in, stops him, and says, stop, stop, everybody stop, stop. And Wynn's like, what's the problem? And he says, you turned away from the microphone, we're getting a bad sound. And he was just furious. And then the guy said, look, I can't put on an album that sounds like that. You know what it'll do to my reputation if you're going up and down? So he wasn't working for Winton. He wasn't working for the band. He wasn't working for the project. He was me. This album is my business card. And I have to worry what people are going to think about that. So, you know, that incredible cultural pressure that we're under to take for ourselves and pursue for ourselves leads us, you know, automatically. Roughly speaking, this is the opposite of friendship, which is to say, what can we do together? What can we share? What can you achieve that I can help you with? What could we achieve together that we would not be able to achieve individually? Again, back to the Epic of Gilgamesh, this is what they do. They kill two godlike monsters, one literally sent by the gods, the bull of heaven. They kill it. This really upsets the gods. And the gods start thinking, perhaps we made a mistake. Because together, as friends, they're so powerful that they even threaten the immortals. That's how powerful friendship is. That when united, you can do things you could never do individually. Ah, but we don't, we don't believe in this culturally. We don't emphasize it. We don't, we don't put, we, you know, just no. And so that's, you know, one of the things I wanted to reflect on is, 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 is where this comes from. Like I said, the I, the I, me, my mind drive, I think, is a big part of it. Uh, an, another aspect of it is, I think, the transfer of the weight to marriage of friendship, which makes sense. This is what Nietzsche is talking about. We've taken a lot of the external friends and said, no, we're going to combine all of that on one person. On, on, in one sense, I think this is great because it is a friendship. You want that long-running friendship. On the other hand, that's a lot of weight for one person to bear. To be your one universal friend, wow. Probably too much. The other side of it is we also tend to be a hypersexualized culture. Anything that's good, particularly involving people, we, you know, should have this erotic component to it. And so when we think of attractive people, people we want to like, almost immediately in our media, TV commercials, advertisements, stories, there has to be a sexual overtone. You can't just be friends. You can't just be partners without some sort of erotic content. It seems like something is missing. And this to me is, is, is terrifying because it's just weird. This is, by the way, this is, there, there, I don't know if anybody saw it, but a couple of years ago it was controversial, finally. Dairy Queen put out a commercial for ice cream cones in which about a seven-year-old boy and a seven-year-old girl were seducing each other over the ice cream cone. Because the only kind of friendship they could really figure out to present was one that had sexual overtones, even though it's two seven-year-old kids. And that was finally a little too far for us. So could, you know, the, the Dairy Queen, you can look this up online. Dairy Queen got a little, people were like, hey, that might not be okay. That's probably not necessary to sell ice cream cones to kids. But for our culture, yeah, you want that investment. So this is, a, this is another entanglement that we offer. And, um, the, the, uh, but the flip side of this is, I don't know if people, uh, who was the actor in, 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 who played House for so many years? Um, some, Hugh, Laurie. Hugh Laurie and Stephen Fry. Stephen Fry says the first time he met Hugh Laurie at Cambridge, he fell madly in love. And that they've been, they've been best friends ever since. And at one point, Stephen Fry did something that, that sort of upset Hugh Laurie. And Hugh Laurie wrote him a letter and said, look, 
you can never do anything like this again to me because it's too painful. In my life, it is too painful for you to betray me that way. And I'll have to stop working with you just because it's, I can't take it. If you're going to do that, I just can't take it. But they're not erotically linked, but that power of that emotional attachment, we tend to think of as you know, a, a friend cheating on someone in a non-sexual way it almost doesn't make sense to us anymore. To betray you when you don't have any sort of promise. Betrayal almost now almost means exclusively right, like sexual betrayal. That's the, almost the primary overtone. What else could it possibly mean? unless you do something, you know, vaguely criminal. So that, you know, these are the problems that we run into. We're isolated, we're scattered, we move around, which makes it difficult. And so we've come up with a great substitute, which is social media, which I just, I, I love the concept of social media. I not love it, I don't love social media, I love the concept of social media, because I think it's fascinating. Uh, but that this is the idea that I have a thousand friends. The, the ancient world would have just, I, I, don't, they, I don't even know what they'd do. I just, they'd just hit you if you said that. If you said, I have a thousand friends, they would say, you're dumb, and walk off. I don't, even, I don't know how they would even respond. They wouldn't know what that would mean. They would just think you were an idiot. Um, but, we, but we have the, the world of social media is a, an attempt to bridge some of these gaps that our culture has created. How do I communicate with my friends when everybody moves all over the country? Well, we can still communicate a little bit. We can send pictures and make comments. But notice what a really sorry substitute this is for spending time, sharing emotion, investing in each other. But the success of social media points out the desire that people have for the connection. So our desire for friendship doesn't seem to have lessened. Our capacity for it seems to have gone down, and our social emphasis on it is certainly extraordinarily weak. Another problem with this, which people are reporting, is friendship is awkward and difficult. Because sometimes we do stuff that makes us feel sort of third rate. I feel like if you've never disappointed a friend, you've never had a friend. But at that point, you have to feel a little like, ah, oh, geez, did I really do that? Yes, I did. Wow. See, that's, that's not good. It's very awkward. And we don't like to feel awkward. And there's also the whole notion of investing in a friend. There's a beautiful play by David Henry Wong. It's a, a very short play, great American playwright, uh, called Sound of a Voice. And the, the woman in the play, it's just two characters, she says at some point, you know, I reveal a little of myself, I reveal a little of myself, and then at some point I reveal too much of myself and I scare the other person away. All I long for is the sound of a voice. I just want to hear a human voice. She's out in the woods on her own. And of course, in the arc of the play, she reveals a little bit, she re and then she re reveals too much and scares the person away. Oh, no, it's a beautiful play for that. But I think it captures this other kind of awkwardness, or another kind of awkwardness, which is that to be honest with someone requires self-revelation. And self-revelation opens us up to judgment. Ah, oh, we hate that. Right? You go, oh, I know it's wrong, or I've, now, I, now, you know, that's, it's a little awkward. See, this is the beauty of social media. You only have to put up the stuff that you like. I always think of social media as the carefully edited marketing package of people's lives. I mean, you just rarely, it's all good stuff almost all the time. I, I, I always want to just start posting random bad things I've done. Just make up shit. Oh yeah, I ran over a dog today. You know, I don't know. Just, just, just and see how long you could go before people just said, just unfriended you, right? They, no one would, would follow because they're like, well, that guy's just all bad news all the time. No, it's oh, my daughter got straight A's and my son got a promotion and I got a new car and we're on vacation. It's all high points. 
See, but that's not what friendship is about. Friendship is about that call at three in the morning. It's like, you're where? Doing what? Oh, really? All right, I'll be there. Right? I mean, it's just that it's, 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 those other, it's all those other moments when things aren't going so well or you don't feel so good or you have done something daft. Um, you know, that builds those bonds. I forget, I, I was looking up quotes for, for tonight and I found a quote, I can't remember her name now. She's a writer and, and she said, um, nothing like puking together to make friends. <laughs> and I thought, right, there is, that, there is that certain element of bonding that takes place in, in, when, when things really have gone wrong, right? When you realize, wow, this, that didn't work at all. Bad idea, what was I thinking? And then somehow that shared bad experience, as much as shared good experiences, and potentially even more than shared good experiences, coming through bad experiences with people really bonds us. But again, it, we don't want to open that out to the world. That's a private thing, which I think is the other problem with social media. Is friendship essentially private, not private not a public thing, and yet social media is essentially a public thing, which I think makes it awkward. Another aspect of our struggle, I think, is, is our Christian tradition, which, uh, like parts of the Hindu tradition, de-emphasizes or is actively hostile to friendship. Uh, if you have an omnipotent, all-knowing, all-seeing God who judges everyone equally, this is roughly the opposite of friendship. Right? And, and many ancient theologians commented on this, that God does not want you to have friends. God wants you to choose God. Forget everybody else. All God's children are equal. Right? If you ever go to Sunday school, that's what you All God's children are equal. All God's, this is an incredibly inhuman attitude. We don't think all God's children are equal. We think our friends are very much better than the rest of the children. And that's why we throw rocks at them at recess, right? I mean, this is, this is the whole structure of human society. Gandhi said the same thing. We should treat all people equally. We shouldn't have favorites. We shouldn't select amongst the people. We should treat them all as one. Theoretically, theologically, maybe okay. Practically, this is a horrible idea. Because then it means you can't have friends. Because the whole point of having friends is to not treat them equally. It's to have a select f small group of people who you treat with very special care and attention. And so thus, as part of the use of philosophy for a living series, like I said, definition, history, current concepts, and now how do you address this philosophically? One aspect of it is to actually think about it. What do I do that makes me a good friend? What do I do that makes me a bad friend? Do I have any friends? What do I even think that means? What would I want a friend to be for me? Who are my friends? How do I know that? If I was keeping some sort of scorecard, would I rate myself a very good friend to these people? Or have I been slacking furiously? And we do this, right? We go through phases. Sometimes you're just busy, things are going on, and you realize all of a sudden, wow, I've just completely neglected somebody who is, in theory, very important in my life. That's perfectly human. But if it goes on long enough, of course, then we end up by ourselves and lonely. But, that is, but it's very easy because our culture presses that. But that, this is the, the use of philosophy is. What do I mean? What do I think? And then, of course, what am I actually doing? What, if, I, if I track my, my hours of my day, how much would it be dedicated to spending with the time or thought or energy or effort do I invest in helping my friends succeed? If I invest all my time and energy in myself, by definition, I'm not, a, I don't, not being a friend. I mean, it's just perfectly clear. If I invest some of my time and energy in other people, select people, ah, now I might be a friend. And then, again, if something works out, they're successful, then you, you reap the rewards. Or if things just go horribly wrong, that's okay, too. 
succeed together, fail together. Um, Cicero, friends, multiply the joy and have the pain. Because you split the pain up and you share all the joy. So I think this is a really fundamentally correct attitude. But like I said, so, so ponder this. Think of all the commercials you've seen about uh, you know, save for retirement, invest in the future, career advancement, this is your educational goals. I can't, I'm, I'm trying to think of one that ever said, how are your friends doing? Right? What have you done for your friends lately? Don't take this money and buy an RRA, do something for your friends. Right? We know that's wrong. By the way, you can't write it off, as far as I can tell. You do not get a tax deduction. <laughs> but, think, but think about that. Notice that we give you a tax deduction if you'll do it for yourself. We do not give you a tax deduction if you do it for somebody else. Your IRA, your savings account. Why, why, why not? Because we know that that's, you should save for yourself. Other people should save for themselves. Why? Another aspect, again, of why I think we've lost track a little bit of friendship is because we do have this massive government safety net, unlike the ancient world or even the recent historical world never dreamed of, or potentially the future world. <laughs> Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, retirement accounts. Now take all that away and now look at the future and say, ooh, I'm one catastrophe or even moderate setback away from really needing friends. See, that, I think that would raise the stakes for us. But our society has been built to liberate the individual. This is what all these programs are about. They're about breaking down our reliance on other people and liberating us as individuals. We don't have to worry about our families so much. We don't have to worry about our friends so much because we have these much larger social structures that we live within that fill the roles previously supported by friends and family. But conversely, if friends are the people that you choose to spend your life with, it shouldn't preclude us from deciding friends are important, but apparently it has, again, culturally, not necessarily individually, but as a culture. We just simply, as far as I can tell, find very little evidence that we value it at all. Not in career choices, not in moving choices, not in living arrangements. I mean, it's a, it's a very strange sort of structure. I was talking to a professor she teaches in Tennessee. Uh, she's from Poland. And, and I said, friendship is indifferent in Poland. She says, oh, absolutely. But she says, in Poland, all of my girlfriends still live where we grew up. I'm the only one who left. Other people have commented that it's difficult to make friends when you go to France. And the evidence is this is true with French people. This is true. Because in France, your friends tend to be associated with your family and the people you went to school with for the rest of your life. And so to try to enter that late, you can. It's just very difficult because their concept of friend is the person they went to kindergarten with. They've known them now for 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years. See, we, we've almost lost that concept because almost none of us live where we went to kindergarten. Statistically, some of us might. And if we do live where we went to kindergarten, all the people we went to kindergarten don't live there. And so that notion of that very long arc of friendship has faded for us. But when we return to the central concept, it is the people that we choose to spend our lives with that have as much impact or more than just about any other thing I can figure out. Like I said, with the exception of health, it's got to be friends, particularly if you include marriage under that umbrella now because it is an elective marriage. We don't have uh, uh, arranged marriages. And so basically you are having that opportunity to marry someone who is a friend. That's the quality of our lives. And I think it bears a lot more pondering, reflection and consideration than we tend to give it as a culture. 
So for me, that's the uses of philosophy for living, to look at my society and go, wow, we really undervalue this friendship concept. Culturally, that doesn't mean I have to. Philosophy can help me free my mind. What have other people said for the last 5,000 years about friendship? Generally, what they've said is it's really, really important, and you can't live a good life without good friends. Now, they might all be wrong, but when Confucius, Mencius, Aristotle, Plutarch, Socrates, Plato, uh, the Zoroastrian priests, uh, you know, uh, Montaigne, John Maynard Keynes, Barzan, when they all say it, at some point I start to suspect I would probably be wrong. Right? If you disagree with everybody, you're not necessarily wrong, but you're probably wrong. And then to then begin thinking, well, how do I address this? If nothing else, what experiment can I run? I mentioned this before, I'm very much in favor of running experiments. How could I run an experiment to see? What could I try and do? How would it change my life if I opened myself up to another person or another two people? How would I feel? What kind of reward would I get? And that's the final thing I want to end with. It's, it's, you're not, friendship is the reward itself, but it is to have a risk, like all other things that have rewards. We can be wrong. We've all chosen the wrong person at one time or other, right? Well, if you hadn't, good on you. But I think most of us have occasionally erred in the choice of people we've decided to spend time with. And it is painful. And it does, you're like, oh, really? Oh, now I've got, oh, yuck. Right? And so it makes us gun shy, I think, a little bit when you've had enough of those experiences. So rather than reflect on why and how and where the judgment went wrong, we tend to just think, well, let's just not bother. So this is the last thought I want to leave you with, is one of the things that many of the ancient philosophers, again, Confucius, all the rest of them talk about, is friends are work. Not bad work, but work. They don't just happen. They aren't magical, that you, you have to do something. You have to be the kind of person who can be a friend and who can have a friend. And so reflecting on it, coming up with a plan and acting is necessary, particularly in a culture which does not emphasize it or give you lots of opportunities to make this happen. So for friendship, I think this is just a great example. When the world looks gray, things don't look that pleasant, the future looks uncertain, look to your friends to boo you, to help you. Divide the pain, multiply the joys. And that, this, is the con, this is the ideal of friendship. Something, a world that we build for ourselves that's better than one we would have left on our own devices. So use the philosophy for living friendship. Thank you. Uh.